you're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 28, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Immunology Course, Sympyrex Chapters 5, 6, and 7, Overview of the Immune System 2. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's the Medical Director of the Section of Immunology and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. So, moving on to Chapter 5, 6, and 7. So, kind of just a refresher of what we have already talked about. So we talked about the two cells of innate immunity, so macrophages, neutrophils, natural filler cells, we talked about complement, and then we talked about B cells, and then we talked about um, antigen presentation, right? So now antigen presentation is done for the T cells for their job. So now we're going to talk about T cells today and then uh, uh, lymphatic um, tissues and traffic. So we'll come back to that. All right, so moving along, we'll be talking about T cell activation first. So in general, for T cells to act, uh, I think we go back to our initial chapters of what, how the cells interact. So they use their receptors. So we talked about how the B cell receptors are made and how they work. And it's a similar concept of where the T cells have a receptor on their surface, and that interacts with the uh, antigen. And once that interaction occurs, there are some other things that go in, uh, take effect. So there is a co-receptor and a co-stimulator that's needed for that activation. And then that signal goes through signaling molecules and reaches the nucleus. So let's talk about receptors. The T cell receptors are two types, alpha, beta, and gamma, delta. So this is on the surface of the T cells. Either the receptor is alpha, beta, or gamma, delta. So T cells don't have both. And so 95% of our T cells have alpha, beta, T cell, uh, TCR. And then 5% have gamma, delta. And so these receptors are made by recombination of gene segments. So remember um, DJ and then VDJ recombination. So that occurs in the T cells as well as B cells. So Proteins that help in initiating that splicing, remember the most important ones that we talk about, what initiates the splicing of those gene segments in that recombination, RAG1 and RAG2, right? So, all right, so that initiates that splicing, then that recombination occurs, so the segments rearrange to form either the alpha-beta or gamma-delta, um, mainly the alpha-beta, um, TCRs. So alpha, beta, TCR containing T cells are called the traditional T cells, which are 95% of our cells, and then 5% of T cells and so these alpha, beta T cells have diverse TCR, a um, lot more diversity than the, the gamma, delta one. These are the cells that get trained in the thymus. They recognize the antigen or the peptide that is bound to the major compatibility complex. And then once that complex interacts, the co-receptors also play a role in that whole interaction. But remember, these T cells are compared, compared to B cells. So B cells are similar, right? They have PCR on their surface. They interact with the, the antigen. Uh, however, the, the, the T cells only interact with proteins or peptides, and B cells can interact with any other uh, any any type of antigen. Uh, they also have co-receptors that they, they use, but the difference between T cells and B cells is B cells undergo hypermutation. So they kind of change, they go undergo further processes where they can change the affinity of their um, BCR compared to T cells where they do not do that. So there's no hypermutation. Now, there are other types of T cells called non-traditional T cells. So they are either gamma delta T cells that we just talked about. These are less diverse um, because their TCR is less diverse. And these are also found in the thymus, but they can be functional even without the thymus. Uh, they do not need MHC for presentation. And they recognize 
different kinds of proteins, so mainly stress proteins like MICA or B. They, again, they, these cells, non-traditional T cells, do not have co-receptors on them. And these are most prominently found in uh, places where our body comes in contact with outside. So that can be oral cavity, intestine, uterus, and uh, all the places where our, um, the tracts that we talk about, so airway, GI tract, GU tract, and things like that. The other type of non-traditional T cells are natural killer T cells, or NK T cells, and they make up about 1% of our lymphocytes. And they have alpha-beta TCR on them too, um, but th these alpha-beta TCR have limited diversity compared to our traditional T cells. All right, and these recognize um, lipids, not peptides, by presentation by some non-classical MSC. So we had talked about this. Anyone remember CD1. the name? CD1. CD1, right. All right. So once that interaction occurs, and we'll talk about how there is co-receptor interaction and co-stimulation, but once that happens, the, TC, the job of the TCR is to send a signal that they received from that antigen or the peptide and MHC that they bound to, to the interior of the cell or the nucleus. So, however, that, the problem with that is for them to send that signal, they need to have that intracellular component, but the intracellular protein part uh, of that TCR is very short. It's only three amino acids long. So it's really hard for that, those chains, the alpha-beta chains, to do the signaling. So they have other chains close to their interior surface that help in signaling. And anyone know what the name of that intracellular protein is? CD3. CD3, okay. And so the CD3 has different... Um, has, has different chains, so uh, gamma, delta, epsilon, and beta chains. So these gamma and delta chains have nothing to do with our non-traditional T cell that has gamma, delta, TCR. So instead of the alpha, beta, TCR up here, some cells, 5% of our cells, have gamma, delta, TCR. Here's our TCR. Now we are talking about the CD3 molecule that's inside the cell. Here's our T cell. This is the cell membrane, and this is the interior of the cell. And the CD3 molecule itself has chains called gamma and delta. And then it also has epsilon and zeta chains. So in general, these chains have some enzymes linked to the, the end of it called kinases that help to send that signal to the interior of the cell. Right. So apart from that, apart from that signaling, remember that this TCR also helps in, there are lots of TCRs on the same cell, so they can help in bringing the, the different TCRs can come closer to each other, just like the BCR, and it's called clustering. So when there is TCR signaling, that also, uh, sorry, TCR clustering, that also helps in activation of that cell just like the BCR. Remember, we had talked about how there can be uh, epitopes that are repeating on some antigens, and once they bind to several BCR on the B cell, those BCR come closer to each other on the surface, and that's called clustering. That helps in activation. So similar to that, TCRs also can undergo clustering, and that would help with activation of the T cell. So why are, when we talked about B cells, we talked about their signaling molecule, Ig, alpha, and beta, that are attached to the BCR. But compared to the T cells, where there are several chains, and so the question is, why are there so many different chains attached to the interior of those T cells? So these, in t these various chains may be playing a role where there is, they help in the versatility of the TCR activation. So once the TCR is activated, depending on the strength of that activation or um, the type of activation, these cells will send signals that can result in either death of the cell, that happens sometimes in the thymus during maturation of these T cells, maybe there is a self antigen that comes across this TCR, it binds so strongly that it actually, that, that interaction causes signaling that causes death of that T cell. On the other hand, there might be 
other times after maturation where they, the T cell comes in contact with various different types of antigens and some antigens will cause activation of the T cell whereas at other times it will actually not respond to that antigen and that, um, that process is called energy. So depending on what, uh, what chains take part in that interaction, the TCR can behave in various different ways, right? We don't understand the process, but that's what we think is the purpose of having all these different chains in the CD3 molecule, signaling molecule of TCR. All right, so that was the TCR. Now we talk about the co-receptors. So here's our T cells, right? This is a CCL and this is a helper T cell, so two different types of T cells. Here's our TCR. In this case, we are going to talk about alpha-beta TCR. So here's our alpha-beta TCR that can interact with the MHC molecule on the antigen-presenting cell. So when we talk about the CTL or CD8 cell, is the reason why we call it CD8 cell is the co-receptor on that cell is, is CD8. And the CD8 co-receptor interacts with MHC1 compared to the helper T cells, where they have co-receptors called CD4 on them, and the CD4 interacts with MHC class 2. So T helper cell interacts with antigen-presenting cell using MHC class 2, and that interacts with CD4 on the surface of helper T cells, compared to the CTLs that interact with antigen-presenting cells using its CD8 co-receptor binding to MHC class 1. So these co-receptors clip onto that MHC molecule, which means when you call it a co-receptor, even the co-receptor for B cells, these co-receptors interact with this other cell or the target cell or the antigen-presenting cell with the same antigen that binds to the receptor. So TCR or BCR binds to the antigen, and the co-receptor also binds to some other part of that antigen, not the same epitope, but some other, some other part of the same antigen um, at, at the same time. So that's the purpose of the co-receptor. So, um, so the binding between the TCR and then the CD3 is loose, Right, and that interacts with the MHC, but the co-receptor actually stabilizes that whole interaction with the peptide and MHC, and that helps in strengthening the TCR signal as well. So that's the purpose of the co-receptor. So when the T cell is undergoing maturation in the thymus, these co-receptors are not initially present. So because the CD4 and CD8, there are two types of co-receptors for T cells, and there is no co-receptor initially, those developing T cells are called double negative T cells, right? So they neither have CD4 on them nor CD8. Once they go through that, they start maturing further, they'll actually have both CD4 and CD8 co-receptors on them, and that stage of development for those thymocytes or T cells in development are called double positive T cells. Once they undergo further maturation, they'll either have CD4 on them or CD8 on them, and that choice of co-receptor is determined by the class of MHC that the T that TCR prefers. And once that choice is made, they either have CD4 on them or CD8 on them, and those are called single positive T cells the ones that we know as mature T cells. They have either CD4 on them or CD8 on them, not both. All right, so here are our mature T cells with the TCR, right? So TCR is bound to the CD3 signaling molecule, and it also has that co-receptor that can be either CD4 or CD8, depending on the type of T cell. So now, apart from these molecules on the surface of T cells or attached to the T cells, there are some other uh, molecules or proteins on the surface that help in that whole overall interaction, right? So that part, that process of um, those molecules are called co-stimulators, and let's see what co-stimulation means. So here are mature T cells. These mature T cells are called naive T cells because they have not yet come in contact with the antigen that they can bind to. 
So these are our mature naive T cells. The naive T cells actually can interact with uh, the antigen, right? But code stimulation is a process that reduces the number of TCRs that need to be clustering or cross-linked to activate 100 times. Otherwise, there needs to be a lot of clustering together. If we don't have as many antigens, right, if it's not a big infection and we only have a small amount of antigen to interact with T cells, it may not activate the T cell at all unless there is co-stimulation. So it, basically, the co-stimulation is a process that strengthens the connection between TCR and the inside signaling, so which goes to the nucleus. So what are these molecules? So the T cells have CD28 on them, and that CD28 interacts with proteins called B71 and B72. These are present on the antigen-present T cell. Once these, uh, these molecules interact, they provide co-stimulation, and that way you don't need that lot of cross-linking on the surface, and these mature T cells, now that they have come in contact with the antigen that they can be activated with, will get activated because there is in not only interaction between TCR and the MHC with peptide and co-receptor, but there is a co-stimulation simulator that's interacting. Once these T cells are activated and they are kind of experienced T cells, for their further activation, they may not need as much co-stimulation. So once activated, they may not need further so for what we are talking about is once it's activated, it does its job and maybe it lingers around like a memory T cell, that cell can get reactivated and at that time it will not need co-stimulation. All right. So let's talk about T cells and uh, cytotoxic T cells uh, because for the process we need resistance for both of them. So what's the interaction looking like on the surface of T cells? So here's a T cell, it's a helper T cell, that comes in contact with an antigen presenting cell. It's a helper T cell, so it has CD4 on its surface, the co-receptor CD4. So the interaction it, uh, includes a lot of molecules. So here's a naive helper T cell, comes in contact with dendritic T cell. TCR, so this is our alpha beta TCR that interacts with the cognate antigen or the peptide that's bound to the MHC class 2, right? Like MHC class 2 itself is clipped on by the CD4 co-receptor. Apart from the TCR and the MHC and CD4 interaction, there are some adhesion molecules on the helper T cells that connect to the dendritic T cells and keep them together and keep that whole interaction stabilized. And so that whole interaction that comes, that is present on the surface of these two cells. Does anyone know what that's called? Synapse. Synapse, right? So it's called immunological synapse. And so that interaction, it basically, each of them, this, the MHC molecule also, the, this interaction with the co-receptor also helps in um, further um, interaction of the adhesion molecules coming closer to each other. But the whole process, results into what something what we call as immunological synapse uh, because it's not an interaction just between one, just the receptor and the antigen. It's like a whole uh, line of interaction on the surface. So what happens as a result of this interaction? Once the TCR binds to that antigen, it upregulates uh, a molecule called CD40 ligand on its surface. And that interacts with CD40, another molecule on the antigen presenting cell. That in itself increases um, the MHC molecules on the surface of dendritic cells and expression of uh, proteins called B7 on their surface. And also, this interaction also helps in prolonging the lifespan of these dendritic cells. Now, this CD40, CD40 ligand interaction is our co-stimulation, right? So this provides a co-stimulation, but it's a um, two-way interaction. So the co-stimulation helps in uh, the activation of the T cells, but at the same time, the T cells are also providing signals to these dendritic cells. That way, they increase the lifespan of dendritic cells that are activating the T cells themselves. 
So they, in, in general, that interaction helps to both ways so that the dendritic still cells uh, stick around longer to help in that activation, right? Otherwise, if the dendritic cell that's, that has that antigen, it's going to activate the T cell, but once it dies, it's no longer useful, then that activation is going to be very short-lived. So that to prevent that, the T cells themselves send signals to dendritic cells to prolong the lifespan of the dendritic cells. All right. So once those dendritic cells are disengaged from that activated T cells, these activated helper T cells will release cytokines. The main one is IL-2, interleukin-2. And the interleukin-2 receptors are present on the activated uh, helper cell itself. So it's actually releasing a cytokine that acts on itself. And that helps in uh, stimulating proliferation of these activated T cells. So what does that happen? What does that result into? It will cause proliferation of the same activated T helper cells and form a clone of those activated T helper cells. All right. Moving along to the cytotoxic T cells. Do you have questions about this interaction? Okay. All right. So then cytotoxic T cells, similar process, but now we are talking about CD8 co-receptor. So the initial interaction is the same. A dendritic cell that is presenting the antigen comes in contact with um, the CTL. Initial interaction may be, in that case, may be only between those two cells. Once it's activated and it's a later act in interaction, there might be helper T cells helping with this interaction as well. So remember, the helper T cells help in interacting, help in the function of cytotoxic T cells, and help the B cells in their function. So when we talk about helper, uh, sorry, uh, cytotoxic T cells, helper T cells all still play a role in that interaction between uh, CD8 cells and their antigen presence. So there might be a three-way interaction between cytotoxic T cells, helper T cells, and dendritic cells. But that would be later in the uh, infection. So I think the process of interaction is the same. Immunological cy synapse is also formed in in this case, so the TCR binds to the antigen that's attached to the MHC class 1 here instead of class 2, and that MHC class 1 interacts with the co-receptor CD8. And the co-stimulation is similar, so it could be CD40, CD40 ligand, or similar kind of co-stimulator molecules on both cells that interact. And once that happens, the T cell is activated. So say here, an activated helper T cell also helps in uh, releasing that IL-2. And that IL-2 has receptors not only on the helper T cells, it's, there are also IL-2 receptors on cytotoxic T cells. So they proliferate, and that, that helps them in efficient killing. They become, they, their lifespan increases, and they can actually uh, form memory cytotoxic T cells. All right, so we just finished talking about activation. So once they are activated and that co-stimulation process makes sure that the activation occurs and signaling occurs, what happens to these T cells? These T cells then differentiate into their effector cells, effector uh, form. So the T cells, remember the B cells are also uh, when we talk about effector molecule for B cells, we are talking about antibodies. So B cells are like the behind the scenes guy, right? And then the job is done by the antibodies. In case of T cells, the T cells initially, when they are activated, they are the behind the cells guys, but they are the same cells, then they are going to differentiate into their effector cells. Uh, so effector cells are called either the helper T cell subsets or the CTLs. So these effector cells, remember we had talked about this in the first chapter, that our T cells are our quarterbacks. They decide on how that um, immunity is built. But there is always a coach that helps guide these T cells, and those are our antigen presenting cells. So typically we talk about dendritic cells. So these are the cells that guide the T cells in their job. So let's initially see what do the dendritic cells um, do to provide that information or guidance to the T cells. 
So they destroy mainly two types of information. The, the dendritic cells tell the T cells what kind of uh, infection it is and where is the infection. So for what kind of invader, they use the dendritic cells use their pattern recognition receptors on their surface, interact with say a bacteria or a virus or a fungus, right, and realizes well this is a different kind of invasion compared to say a virus compared to a bacteria versus fungus. And it releases it uses the cytokine receptors. So based on what kind of cytokines are released because of that particular infection, the cytokine receptors on the dendritic cells are going to be different that are going to be engaged. And so those are the types of those are the two molecules that they use on their surface to determine the type type of invasion, to get that information about the type of inv invasion. And that process that helps to the dendrit dendritic cells to pass that information to T cells to see how. And then the second information that they collect is the site of invasion. So is the infection in the gut or is it in the skin or is it somewhere else? And the cytokines that are released are different in different places. So that the receptors on the dendritic cells that are engaged by those cytokines make sure that the dendritic cells have that information. Now that the dendritic cells have that information of, say, a fungal infection in the skin, okay, so if that information is with the dendritic cells, how do they pass this information to the T cells? So they, for that, they use the co-stimulatory molecules and the cytokines that they release, and that those, those molecules are used to pass on that information to the T cells. Okay, because during their interaction with the T cells, they are going to release cytokines based on the infection that they are seeing or where they are seeing that infection. And that's going to help the T cells figure out what they are dealing with. All right. So that's the part that the dendritic cells or their coach plays for the T cells. Based on that information, the T cells are going to differentiate. Now these are activated T cells. T cells are now already activated by these dendritic cells. Now they have the information that they need. They are going to differentiate into different types of effector T cells. So it could be T helper cells type 1, 2, 17, TH0, which means they still don't know which kind they'll uh, differentiate into, or T regs, or the CTLs that differentiate into effector CTLs. All right, so let's, move, let's see what the different types of the so first we are going to talk about the T helper cells. So the subsets are Th1, Th2, Th17. The Th1 cells, so imagine a, um, an infection by some intracellular organism. That could be a virus, that could be an intracellular bacteria, it could be a mycobacteria that's intracellular, or when you place a TB test. In all those cases, these microbes, are going to be um, in that these are going to come in contact with the dendritic cell, right? This dendritic cell is going to use its pattern recognition receptors and the cytokines in this in the environment based on this infection, and going to realize that what kind of infection it is and where is it. It's going to release IL-12 in this case because it's an intracellular uh, infection, and that's going to interact with the helper T cells. So the initial interaction is PCR with the MSC and the antigen or the peptide that it has come across. There is going to be a core receptor that's going to interact with the MSC class 2. And then it's going to release cytokines. So in this case, it would be IL-12. And because of that, this helper T cell is going to differentiate into a Th1 cell that's going to release cytokines like TNF, interferon gamma, IL-2. Remember, IL-2 is the one that helps in proliferation and clone formation. Apart from that, TNF is going to activate macrophages and natural killer cells. Interferon gamma is going to also in, uh, uh, keep the macrophages activated. And interferon gamma also helps cl uh, class switch B cells to release more inter uh, immunoglobulin G, right? So in effect, now as a result of this interaction, there are macrophages natural killer cells, and immunoglobulin G that helps in fighting a bacterial or a viral infection. Okay. 
Uh, and then the IL-2 is also helpful in proliferation of NK cells, cytotoxic T cells that help to kill this um, microbe. Now let's compare that to Th2 cells. Say there is a parasitic infection or there is an ingestion of a pathogen, which means there is a gut infection or mucosal infection. In those cases, there, is, there are cytokines such as IL-4 in the environment, so the dendritic cells pass on the information about the type of infection and the site of infection to the helper T cells, as a result of which these helper T cells differentiate into becoming Th2 cells. And that Th2 cell is then going to release cytokines like IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. What do these cytokines do? IL-4 is a growth factor for helper T cells, right? But apart from that, they also help in growth of T cells and class switch them to IgE instead of IgG. And then IL-5 helps in class switching to IgA that's helpful in mucosal infections. And then IL-13 helps in production of mucus. So the mucus, IgA, IgE, all these molecules help in fighting a parasitic infection or, in, or ingested pathogen. And then the third one, say there is an infection by a fungus or a, an extracellular uh, bacteria. So say a gram-negative infection uh, by staph or, uh, sorry, uh, by um, gram-negative bacteria or positive bacteria just as, just such as staph or strep. So in these cases, the neuritic cell releases cytokines such as TGF beta IL-6, and that helper T cell differentiates into becoming a helper T cell type 17, TH17. And that TH17 releases cytokines like IL-17 and IL-21. These help in class switching to immunoglobulin G and recruiting neutrophils. So neutrophils are what you need for fighting infections such as fungal infection or extracellular bacteria. So remember, there is the, the end result is what you want. So for fungal infection or extracellular bacteria, you need more immunoglobulin G and neutrophils. For that, you need these cytokines. The helper T cells realizes the message from dendritic cells based on the cytokines that it releases that the helper T cells need to become TH17 cells to release those cytokines that are needed. Same with the parasitic infection or intracellular infection where the Th2 or Th1 cells are formed and release cytokines that are needed during that particular infection, right? So there are times when there are the, the dendritic cells activate the T helper cells. They give them the information about the site of infection, but they do not really give them the information of what kind of helper T cell is needed. And so in those cases, these are Th0 cells they don't commit to a type particular helper subset, but they go to the site of infection because now they know where the infection is. So they are activated, but they go to the site of infection, see what kind of cytokines are present at the site of infection, and based on that, that helper T cell may become either a Th1 or a Th2 or a Th17 cell based on the cytokines that are present at that site. So those are the Th0 cells. So we looked at all these uh, subsets. So remember, each subset of helper T cells makes sure that it provides positive feedback for their own growth. So the, the uh, Th2 cells produce IL-4. IL-4 is a growth factor for the Th2 cells themselves. But they'll be pro providing negative feedback for other subsets. So when there is a parasitic infection, the helper T cells that are around they need to grow into becoming Th2 cells, and we don't need Th1 cell or Th17 cell. So producing their own growth factor helps with fighting that particular infection at that particular point, right? So uh, the negative feedback is similar. So negative feedback, the growth factor will reduce the proliferation of other subsets. So interferon gamma will provide negative feedback for helper 2 cells or IL-10 will make sure that there are not as many Th1 cells that are being produced, so depending on the type of uh, infection and subset that's needed. Besides that, you have to remember that it's not a fixed um, profile for these helper subsets. 
So there is flexibility based on what kind of different infection is occurring. So there is some plasticity so to changing those subsets of helper T cells. Besides that, say there is a skin infection by, say, someone has a ringworm or something, some fungal infection on the skin. At the same time, they can actually have a GI infection. They can have a, uh, some kind of gastrointestinal infection. So in those cases, there can be two types of subsets needed at two different sites. So the, the cytokines that are released have a local action. So there can be helper T cells going to two sites and fighting two different infections in the presence of two different environments of cytokines. So the lo local, infect, uh, local action of the cytokines help to keep this um, TH profile just limited to that site of infection. All right, now moving along from helper T cells to effective CTLs. So again, these are the CTLs that were activated. They have come across their uh, antigen. They got activated through that immunological synapse. Now they are interacting with their target cell, right? These are CTLs that, are, that have to kill the target cell. So in that immunological climate, there are uh, enzymes that are released from the CTL called perforin and granzyme D. Perforin is the uh, protein that drills holes in the target cell. So it basically just acts like a complement protein that, remember the membrane attack complex that makes a hole in the target cell? Perforin does a similar job. Once that hole is created, granzyme and the perforin, so granzyme B and perforin are taken into that target cell in form of vesicles. Once they are inside that target cell, perforin again drills a hole in that vesicle, and so granzyme B is released into that cell. And once it's released, it, it basically granzyme B uh, sends signals for apoptosis of that target cell, and that's how the cell is killed. So that's only one way of how CTLs kill that target cell. Besides that, they also use another system called fast, fast ligand system to kill their target cell. So CTLs have fast ligand on their surface. So it's a protein. It's a protein that's called fast ligand. And when it interacts with a target cell that has a protein called FAS on their surface, that interaction between FAS and FAS ligand sends signals for apoptosis of the target cell. So regardless of which type the, cell is, the target cell is killed, um, either, by, either of, by either of these mechanisms in the CTL. All right, so these were T cells at work. Either helper T cells interacting with different kinds of cells and providing help, or killer T cells that are interacting with the target cells. Question at this point. We're going to switch gears. All right, moving along. Secondary lymphoid organs and lymphocyte trafficking. So I think this is an important concept to learn how these cells interact with each other. The cells interact with each other because they come in contact with each other, and that's only possible because of the secondary lymphoid organs and how these lymphocytes uh, travel. So what are the primary lymphoid organs? Bone marrow, thymus. Bone marrow, thymus. And then uh, secondary lymphoid organs are lymph nodes, spleen, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. Oh, small. And, yeah. Right, small. Right. <coughs> So all of those, right? So remember, there are three phases of defense, recognition of danger. So we talked about antigen-presenting cells and how they recognize that uh, antigen. Production of appropriate weapons, so say B cells or T cells or complement, uh, however they provide that effector molecule. And then trans transport of those weapons to the site of attack, and then that weapon is used, right? So that transport is provided by these. So let's talk about the secondary lymphoid organs. So regardless of what kind of lymphoid organ it is, it has a structure called lymphoid follicle in it. And there is another important structure that I wanted to talk about, which is called high endothelial venules. One of them doesn't have it, but we'll talk about it. All right. So let's talk about the structure called lymphoid follicle. The so lymphoid follicle can be two types, primary or secondary, based on uh, the um, level of maturation. So what is the lymphoid follicle made of? 
It is basically a collection of cells called follicular dendritic cells and those are surrounded by B cells around it. So the B cell region in any secondary lymphoid organ is called a lymphoid follicle. These follicular dendritic cells are pr pr uh, produced during this. They are actually in present even in the second trimester. They are already present in the secondary lymphoid organ. These are star-shaped mm. cells and they display the antigen to B cells. How do they do that? These cells are in the secondary lymphoid organs. They have uh, receptors for complement receptors, for complement uh, fragments. So complement brings antigens that are to be presented to B cells. And once the complement fragment comes attached to that antigen, these FDCs will bind to the complement because they have complement receptors on them. And so that, that way they can present those antigens to the B cells. All right. So here's our primary follicle. Here are our star-shaped FDCs, and here are our B cells surrounding them. So we just talked about this. So they have complement receptors. They also have FC receptors that bind to antibody uh, optimized antigens. So they, they can bind to antibodies or immunoglobulins, and they can bind to complement. And then once they display that antigen on their surface, they'll present that antigen to the B, cell, B cells. And because they can, they can help in cross-linking those B cells, they'll help in activation of those B cells. As the B cells get activated, this follicle grows. And once they are activated, the B cells form something called a germinal center. And once that germinal center is formed, that follicle is called secondary follicle. Let's see the germinal center. Here's the germinal center, which means once the B cells get activated, they proliferate so much, they actually create something called dark zone of where there are just several B cells that are proliferating. Um, and then there is a light zone where there are the other cells. Because remember, once one B cell is activated by a specific antigen, that specific B cell will proliferate. The other B cells with other specificity are not going to proliferate and they're going to continue to stay in that light zone. Um, so uh, when the B cells proliferate, they need help from the T cells to survive. Uh, so they need a rescue signal because otherwise they'll die. Uh, this is provided by the helper T cells. Once they start proliferating and act, get activated, they go through differentiation to become plasma cells. Once they become plasma cells, they're going to leave this germinal center and go to the bone marrow, right? They're going to be transported to bone marrow where they can produce immunoglobulins. In this germinal center is where they undergo, these B cells will undergo processes called class switching and somatic hypermutation. So we had talked about these two processes. They need helper T, help from the T cells for these processes to make better quality uh, immunoglobulins, right? So they need different classes of immunoglobulin and they need better affinity of those immunoglobulins. So to undergo these processes, in the germinal center, they need help from the T cells. Let's talk about this second structure called high endothelial venule. So high endothelial venule is a venule, which means it's a part of the blood vessel. So it's a blood vessel that's in secondary lymphoid organs. And this part of the venule, apart from the normal endothelial cells, will have like a column-shaped cell called high endothelial cell or H. Um, so these are called HEVs and this is the high endothelial cell that will help in lymphocytes to wiggle through and get out of that circulation from the venule and go into the secondary lymphoid organ. All right. So all the secondary lymphoid organs have HEVs except for spleen. And so um, basically once that high endothelial venule at, the, at that site there can be about 10,000 lymph lymphocytes that can be uh, wriggling out of the blood circulation into the secondary lymphoid organ. So let's talk about different secondary lymphoid organs. So uh, the first one, the most important one, is the lymph node, right? So let's talk about this lymph node. So let's look at the structure. So it has a lot, two types of plumbing, right? It has the blood circulation and it has a lymphatic circulation. So the lymph, incoming lymph comes through the lymphatics, incoming lymphatics, and gets released into this marginal sinus. 
In that marginal sinus, there are some macrophages that will actually filter that lymph with, for like bigger antigen molecules. And then the rest of the lymph is going to be, uh, is going to flow through that uh, organ or the lymph node. When it flows through the lymph nodes, the, some of the lymphocytes, B cells, will get attracted to go to the follicles. Remember, the lymphoid follicles are where the FTCs are, and that's the B cell region. So lymphoid follicles are our B cell region, are in the B cell region. That region is called the cortex. Next to the cortex is called the paracortex, and that's our T cell region. And after the T cell region or the paracortex, inside the paracortex is our medullary sinus. Through that medullary sinus, the lymphatic goes into the outgoing lymphatic. Right. Besides that, there is an arterial that brings in the blood and then venule that takes away the blood from the lymph node. So where does, do the lymphocytes enter? Lymphocytes enter through either through the blood circulation, right, through the venules, HEVs that we just talked about, or they might be coming from the lymph. Lymphocytes exit mainly through the lymph, from the lymph nodes. On the other hand, so remember for this interaction for the APCs, the interaction of APCs and lymphocytes, the whole goal is for the antigen to come in contact with the lymph, uh, lymphocyte. So where does the antigen come from? Antigen comes fr through the lymph. So there are can be dendritic uh, cells or complement and antibodies that are attached to the antigens that bring in the antigen. And then uh, we just talked about the circulation. So that's the structure. So how does, do the uh, lymphocytes know where to go? So the lymphocytes, when they enter the lymph node, they are either B cells or T cells, for example. The T B cells end up in the B cell region or the cortex, and then the T cells go to the paracortex or the T cell region. So the, how do these cells know where to go once they are inside the lymph node? So the FDCs that are present in the lymphoid follicles release chemokines um, that attract the B cells to that zone. So in this case, the FDCs release CXCL13, a chemokine called CXCL13 that helps in attracting B cells. These, these B cells are naive B cells, which means they are not activated. Once they are activated, those B cells now will actually down-regulate the receptors for this chemokine and up-regulate another rece receptor called CCR7, which means that receptor is going to bind to a chemokine called CCL7. And the reason for that is that CCL7 will help them take to take these cells to the border of T and B cells, so between the cortex and the paracortex. Once they are in that region, they interact with the helper T cells, which are in the T cells. So that's the reason for the B cells to move away from the B cell region and go closer to the T cells so that they can interact with the helper T cells. Once they are, um, on the other hand, the activated helper T cells downregulate CCR7, so they are now moving away from the T cell region, and they upregulate CXCR5, which are the receptors that will attract them to the chemokine CXCL13. That way they go towards the follicle. The T cells are initially um, going to have CCR7 on them that will attract them to the T cell region. B cells have uh, CXCR5 on them, they are attracted to the B cell region. Once these cells are activated, they need to get to the border of the cortex and paracortex, so they actually down-regulate the initial receptor and up-regulate the other one. That way they go to the opposite uh, area or opposite region or the border of that. All right, so um, this is the interaction between the once they are at that border, right, B cells and the T cells interact. So that interaction includes TCR interacting with the MHC molecule on the B cell along with that antigen. This is the activated B cell, so it has come across that antigen. It uses the same antigen with the MHC class 2 and presents it to the helper T cells. It also has this co-stimulation, which is CD40, CD40 ligand interaction. And once that interaction occurs, 
uh, the T cells can help B cells in their job. B cells also actually help the T cells. So our initial, you know, when we talk about B cells, helper T cells interact with B cells and help them make good antibodies. Also, B cells make uh, some molecules such as B7 and ICOS ligand that interact with molecules on T helper cells and help T cells. So it's a two-way interaction here as well. So the follicular helper T cells rescue the B cells from apoptosis. They help in class switching and somatic hypermutation. So when there is interaction with these cells in the germinal center, they form helper T cells called follicular helper T cells. These follicular helper T cells um, are the ones that help in class switching and somatic hypermutation. Once that occurs, these B cells differentiate into plasma cells. They make low affinity. These plasma cells make low affinity IgM without the help of these helper T cells. But once the, help, the follicular helper T cells um, interact with B cells, the high affinity immunoglobulins can be made. All right. Now we move along. So those were the B cells. The T cells, I think the interaction, I, uh, we are not going to go through how those get activated, but overall there is T cell recirculation that occurs all the time through the, lymph, uh, through the blood circulation, to the lymphatic flow, to the various lymph nodes. So during the day, the lymph, the lymph, one lymph, each like specific lymphocyte is going from one lymph, lymph node to another one looking for the antigen that it can uh, get activated with. So the naive helper T cells in the blood go to the lymph node. And if in, during that stay in the lymph node, if it does not come across a, an antigen presenting cell with that particular antigen, it will re-enter the blood. If it does come in contact with the antigen that will activate it, it gets activated. Because it got activated, it will actually be retained in the lymph node for a longer time. It will proliferate, and it will also increase activation. Uh, it will undergo an increased activation while in contact with that antigen presenting cell. Once then it exits the lymph node, it re-enters the blood, and it, under, it, it goes to the site of infection, and it will go, uh, go through the, to the site of infection and uh, get, uh, get to the site of infection and get released into the tissue instead of recirculating. If it does uh, undergo the activation, it can re-enter lymph node through the HEV. Okay. So it depends on whether it's going to be activated or not, where it's going to re-enter. This is a CTL. So we talked about the helper T cell. If it's a CTL, it will, again, it comes across the dendritic cell with the antigen that activates it. It gets activated. It will proliferate, so it will stay in the lymph node for a longer time. It will proliferate, and then it will recirculate, or it will go to the tissue where it, the infection is and help with the killing. All right, so that was the lymph node. Now we're going to talk about Peyer's patches. The Peyer's patches are present in the gut. It's a type of lymphoid tissue. Um, here, again, we're going to talk about how the lymph uh, lymphocytes get in contact with the antigen. All right, so let's see. Here is our intestinal cell. Intestinal cells, uh, sorry, the intestinal wall where there are different cells and there are, there is a particular type of cell called M cell on its surface. That M cell comes in contact with the intestinal lumen where it will come in contact with certain antigens and it will get that antigen, um, interact with that antigen. This M cell does not have any villi on it, so the other intestinal cells have villi on it. This M cell does not have any uh, villi on it, neither does it have muc mucus coating. So it can easily come in contact with the antigen. It will bind to that antigen and transport that antigen from the lumen to the tissue and then lymph nodes. So there are outgoing lymphatics from the M cell, but there are no uh, incoming lymphatics into that lymph node for the Peyer's patches. So Peyer's patches will get their lymphocytes through the HEVs, 
there are outgoing lymphatics that will take away the uh, that will help in the outgoing lymph, but the antigen comes from the M cells or from the lumen. There are other um, there are also some FDCs in the lymphoid follicles in the uh, pyres patches. So the, there are FDCs similar to the lymph nodes in these pyres patches. The difference between spleen and other secondary lymphoid is that the spleen does not have HEVs, right? So the lymphocytes are not coming through the high endothelial venules. There is free flow of blood through the spleen. Remember, spleen is called a filter for the blood. So the artery brings in the blood. It flows through that spleen, and it if the lymphocytes can freely enter through the splenic tissue. There are no incoming lymphatics, but there is an artery that brings in the blood, it goes through the marginal sinus, and then goes through the red cells, and then through the vein. In the marginal sinus, across from that arterial, when the blood enters, it goes into this marginal sinus, there are macrophages. These macrophages will actually pick up the bigger antigens, and that Way it filters the bigger antigens. The, lymph, the lymphocytes again find their B cell area and T cell area in the spleen. So what's the B cell area called? So here is our B cell area where they form those lymphoid follicles similar to the lymph nodes. The T cell area is called PAS. Does anyone remember, does this, do the second years remember what the PAS stands for? It's called periarterial lymphoid sheet. Right, so it's next to the artery. So here's the artery, and across from that, just a line close to that artery, is our uh, PALS or T cell area. So remember PALS, you have to remember what it stands for, what kind of region is it. So anyways, for any secondary lymphoid organ, T cell region is where you find the lymphoid follicles. Right, and then the T cell region is either called the paracortex, as in lymphoid, uh, lymph nodes, and in the spleen, it's called PALS. All right, so we talked about this. The uh, secondary lymphoid organs are in strategic position, which help in trans uh, transport of the lymphocytes from one to another and uh, they help in interaction with the antigens and APCs, and that way they can produce, they can get activated and produce the uh, effector molecules that they are um, designed to make. The last concept, I think this is the last slide, the last concept is about adhesion molecules or lymphocyte trafficking. So based on the site of infection or site where these lymphocytes need to go, they need certain chemokines or adhesion molecules that attract them to that site, and then those adhesion molecules help them get into that tissue. Otherwise, they'll keep recirculating. So for them to come out of the tissue and go to a site, that concept is called homing. All right, so they home to particular tissue, these lymphocytes. Will, under, will continue to go through recirculation, and that's called lymph node homing because they have L-selectin on them that binds to uh, an adhesion molecule group, like M1 in the lymph node. Similarly, there are some uh, lymphocytes that will go to the um, gut because they have uh, alpha-4, beta-7 on their surface, and that can come in contact with some adhesion molecule called MADCAM1 that's present in uh, mesenteric lymph node. All right, and so again, these are li uh, naive lymphocytes. Once these lymphocytes are activated or they are effector uh, lymphocytes, their circulation is very restricted. So they won't recirculate. They won't go from one lymph node to another. They'll actually home to the site of infection where they are needed. So that could be the gut or skin or some other uh, other place. So depending on that, these activated lymphocytes will gain the molecules or uh, adhesion molecules that will help them home to that particular uh, tissue, such as alpha E, beta 7, that interacts with a, a, uh, a, an adhesion molecule called adresin, 
uh, that's present in, in places like this.